this is serious, serious stuff. When there's a claim of a 91% increased risk of heart disease with any kind of diet, we're gonna stop and we're gonna look at this and we're gonna stop what we're doing, we're gonna pump the brakes. And we need to because this is very serious stuff. The American Heart Association came out based upon something that was released at a conference that intermittent fasting or those that intermittent fast have a 91% increased risk of heart disease. And it's really serious and we need to talk about this. We're gonna break it down. And I also have a very special guest that is very well credible and you've probably heard of him before. And he's going to give his take on this as well because I also wanna have a true practitioner provide some insight into this as well. After today's video, I popped a link down below for 50% off of Create creatine gummies. Yes, they're creatine gummies, but they're sweetened with allulose. Okay, so you're getting less of the sugar that you would get in a typical gummy. Not to mention there's 1.5 grams of creatine per gummy. So this means that you can stagger your dosing of creatine and hopefully not get as much water retention as if you were like just taking a big bolus all at once. But also it allows you to do these little micro doses of creatine that might be good for nootropic brain effect, sleep deprivation, recovery, or you can go a little bit heavier and get the muscle building effect. I don't like taking creatine all in one sitting. I tend to get puffy. I like to trickle it in throughout the day. And the thing is with these Create gummies, first of all, 50% off discount link, but second of all, they taste delicious. They've got watermelon, blue raspberry, and orange. And before you say, oh my gosh, this is gummy, another gummy, this and that, these are different in the fact that they're sweetened with allulose and they have just enough carbohydrates to help with the creatine delivery. So that link down below is for 50% off and a big thank you to Create for sponsoring content and allowing us to bring new emerging science to you like we do today. Serious, serious, serious stuff. You put the words heart disease in something, we're gonna stop. And that's exactly why they did this. Because even these organizations and all the PR companies and all the different outlets that are milking this flipping dry, they know it. They need the clicks. Now, before you turn off this video thinking, okay, yep, it's bogus, I knew it. I think you should really sit and maybe have a laugh. And let's just have a little chuckle at where some of science is going with this one. Because slow clap, even slower clap, I think this one might actually take the cake. Before we dive into the specifics of the study, I encourage you to use some common sense for a second. This study claims that just simply going from eating 12 hours to consolidating to eight hours, just from 12 to eight hours, just by consolidating your eating four more hours, you increase your risk of heart disease by 91%. Does that actually make sense? Like when you really like think about it at all, Okay, I, uh, I eat from seven to seven or I eat from 11 to seven. Do you really think you're gonna have almost a 100% increased risk of heart disease? I didn't think so. What's funny is that the senior study author of this study actually prefaces this whole study by saying that intermittent fasting has been great for cardiometabolic parameters. So then why did 20,000 participants demonstrate that fasting increases heart disease? Well, let's start off with something that's pretty important. You generally need a clinical trial to say anything with conviction, right? We know a lot of people in the space that will say you need a randomized control trial. You need a clinical trial. Well, zero clinical trial whatsoever with this. Zero, none whatsoever. Not even data gathering. So if you have like a meta-analysis or systematic review or whatever, you're gonna gather data. And it's not like you're just pooling data together from random places. No, there's a strategy to pooling data there was zero data gathering. This was looking at one random survey that had nothing to do with fasting in the first place from 2003 to 2018. Like it was a body of data. This body of data was called the National Health and Nutrition Exam Surveys. It basically, it just had people log their food and some people they had logged their food for longer periods of time, but generally it was just a couple of days, but they ran this survey for a number of years. And the actual amount of data they were using for this particular intermittent fasting thing was about eight years worth of data. 
They then looked at people that had died from cardiovascular disease from the CDC database, and they kind of cross-referenced that. It was as observational as observational gets. It is literally, and I mean literally, like looking at a piece of paper with a survey, and it says, oh, well, these people skipped breakfast, and then they died of heart disease. Fasting causes heart disease. It had no rhyme or reason to actual fasting. And let's be real here, 2003, was anybody even talking about intermittent fasting as a, a fad or even a practical lifestyle? I mean, like maybe the Bragg people, like Patricia Bragg, and like, like there was like some communities that might have been into it, but it was very fringe. It wasn't even popularized until later. So do you think in 2003, people were like, I'm intermittent fasting. It didn't even get popular until like 2015. These were literally more than likely people that just didn't, eat breakfast. Or if they did, they would maybe eat a Nutrigrain bar and were like, oh, I didn't have breakfast, I just had a Nutrigrain bar. Or I had a Gatorade, or I had a smoothie, or whatever. No actual data collection. So it's just people that ate most of their calories in the afternoon or evening. That's it. And then, okay, well, they also had heart disease. I know a ton of people that don't eat breakfast and then will go get a McFlurry and a Big Mac like later in the day. <laughs> It's just not how this works. Here's what's funny, I'm gonna read a quote from the lead author of this paper as well. Although the study identified an association between an eight hour eating window and cardiovascular disease related death, this does not mean that time restricted eating causes cardiovascular disease death. Why, why even do this weird release? Like, I don't wanna say there's an agenda, I don't like to think like that. But why even create the high, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> because eyeballs, because we're all competing for eyeballs on the internet. So when the lead author is saying like, hey, this doesn't really correlate, but people are like, ah, I'm gonna leak this and I'm gonna get it out to People Magazine and oh, we're gonna win the clicks for that day. I wanna introduce a good friend, Dr. Tommy Wood, who's been on this channel before and he recorded his own little bit that I think is important to hear because it's coming from a practitioner and someone who knows what they're doing. Tommy's an MD, he's an amazing dude, an amazing friend. So. Check out what Tommy has to say. Hello, everybody. A few comments on this study, which has gotten a lot of press, uh, suggesting that those who eat in less than an eight-hour uh, window every day have an increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease in particular. Um, I've been really surprised by how much this has appeared in the media in particular uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, the first being the type of study that it is this is not a peer-reviewed study that's been published in a journal that's had the methods and uh, the results sort of had their tires kicked by experts. This is just an abstract from a conference. And those of you who don't know this from academia, what happens is that there are conferences every year where um, people go and present preliminary work to other experts in the field who are interested in specific topics. Um, and this is exactly what's happened here. So. Um, one of the problems with this is we can't see the full methods that, that they've used. Uh, they generally can only submit a few hundred words to cover the entire study, uh, including the methods and results. Um, the other main issue is that this is usually uh, preliminary kind of work, definitely not uh, the finished article. And a lot of studies that get presented as abstracts at conferences never see the light of day because uh, the results are either too preliminary or the methods just aren't good enough uh, to allow it to be fully published. Uh, a group led by Edward Archer published a study uh, now 10 years ago uh, in uh, the journal PLOS One where they looked at how plausible the Darcher data are from NHANES. And this actually included several of the years that are included in this study from 2003 to 2010. That was the last study that uh, the last years they looked at in this study. But what they found is that only about 45% of men and a third of women reported physiologically plausible food intakes. So looking at this person's demographics, their height and weight and things like that, you can estimate roughly how many calories they might be eating. And the majority of people um, in NHANES are not reporting uh, what they're eating and when accurately, because the, what they're reporting doesn't uh, isn't physiologically plausible based on what we know, uh, the other things we know about them. So that means the majority of uh, NHANES dietary data are essentially completely useless. The authors, um, it's fair to say, 
uh, do tell us that we can't really get causation from these data. They know the data are poor quality. And one of the ways we know that is because of uh, more than 43,000 people they could have included, they excluded more than half and got it down to about 20,000 because, you know, largely because of uh, implausible dietary data. Then the last couple of things that, that we need to point out is that only 414 people um, actually ended up in the less than eight hour group. Um, this is less than 1% of the full sample and 2% of the final sample of 20,000 people. And you could, and they were comparing that to 11,000 people in the 12 to 16 hour group. There are uh, a number of issues with this. I won't give you a statistics lesson, but basically when we're doing uh, this kind of work, Anything that happens in less than 5% of the population is generally not looked at because we know these are just outliers. These are, these are uh, people who are just different from everybody else. Uh, and we can't really ask whether this one thing that the window they're eating in has any effect on their health. Um, and there are, there are some uh, clues to this because when you look at the demographic data, I've, I found uh, their, their poster. Uh, so we could see some tables of, of the individuals. Um, and the demographic BMI and smoking data, for instance, were different in this group compared to the other groups. They had the highest BMI and they were most likely to be smokers. And if you think about uh, the type of people who maybe then fit in this group, these are not people who are going to be eating in a certain uh, meal window for, for health reasons. Uh, again, because, you know, say they're, they're more likely to be smokers than the other group. Um, and so then you might think about what are the other reasons that... Um, they ended up in this eight-hour eating, eating window. Maybe they don't have the time or the money uh, to eat uh, in a wider window, which would be associated with a whole host of other things, including um, you know healthcare issues and other health issues. Um, or maybe they don't want to report what they're actually eating. You know, if you're having a very unhealthy breakfast um, and you know, you're not likely to tell the person on the other end of the phone that that's the case, and you just say you didn't eat anything when actually you could have been eating something that, that isn't supporting your health. Um, and then the final clue that there's something a little strange about uh, this group of individuals. You know, they are definitely outliers, you know, less than 1% of the people who are included in, in or could have been included in this study. But they had an average age of 41. Um, and in up to uh, sort of 10 or 15 years uh, follow-up, uh, 85 of them died. Uh, so that's 20, uh, more than 20% died when they started at an average age of, of 41. So these are people who are clearly already in very poor health um, at the time of the, the, the start of the study. Um, and it's probably got absolutely nothing to do with their eating window. And there are a whole host of other factors that it could explain these results, including the fact that the dietary data probably aren't uh, useful at all uh, in the first place. Hope that helps. If you're not convinced yet, then I don't know what's really going to convince you, but I need you to stick with the rest of this video because I promise you it's getting even funnier. It's getting crazier. And you need to shout this from the rooftops because there are people out there that 100% would align with us otherwise, but they just are so hard opposed to fasting that they're taking this and they're running with it. People that are normally very evidence-based people and they're taking this, using it as an opportunity to shoot down fasting. I don't care whether you like fasting or don't like fasting. Like we need to be real about this stuff. So check this out. They completely 100% invalidate themselves with this line. The nutrient quality of the diets typical of the different subsets of participants differ. Without this information, it cannot be determined if nutrient density might be an alternate explanation to the findings that currently focus on the window of time for eating. They flat out said, flat out said, well, it's probably could not be the time that's the issue here. It couldn't, maybe it's not the window of time that they're actually eating. It could actually be the quality of the food. Maybe that matters. Maybe, just maybe. And they actually mention it and invalidate themselves. Why is this out there? But guess what? Eight years of data and they created this entire buzz and made these assumptions off of two days of eating logs from random people in the survey. They took two days as excerpts and they used those as the golden rule. So for all we know, there's 365 days in a year times eight, however many thousands of days that is, they took two days as their snapshot in time and said, well, these people skipped breakfast or ate later in the day. 
in an eight hour block for these two days, that constitutes as living the fasting lifestyle. And that gave them heart disease. They could have skipped breakfast that day, had a McFlurry that day, whatever. But wait, 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 wait. Did you think that it could get worse? You probably did because we know what's going on now. We know how this works. This always happens. Many of the people, and we don't have all this data because there's no flipping data collection, already had metabolic issues, cardiovascular disease, cardiometabolic, poor cardiometabolic parameters. When they start it, that's called reverse causation, my friends, where you have a subset of people. Let's just say, for example, let's just pretend, for example, you've got healthy people that were fasting, but then you've got a lot of unhealthy people that said, well, I'm going to practice intermittent fasting because I want to lose weight. So they took a look at their blood work when they started fasting and it was unhealthy because they were still overweight. They just started, but they said, well, you're fasting and your blood works bad and you're overweight. So fasting makes you overweight and have bad blood work. That's how they got this, right? So they have people that already had cardiovascular issues and they're saying, well, yeah, look at this. Let's look at this correlation. The most association-based nonsense BS that I have seen to date. So congratulations. Congratulations, we have absolutely done a good job at scaring people for about 48 hours before they forget what the heck even happened and they go back to scrolling Instagram reels, watching panda bears paint watercolors of beautiful waterfall landscapes. I'll see you tomorrow.